to equip your character at ECJC! <laughs> My name is Ryan Grady, and let me tell you why you should be here and listen to me today. Uh, well, first off, maybe you shouldn't, that's completely personal choice. But I have all been in your seats before. I have gone to school for a really long time. I have a background in studio art, so I like went to a little place called North Carolina School of the Arts, if any of y'all have heard of it. Then I went and got my studio art undergrad degree at Appalachian State University. Then I got went to graduate school, because apparently I thought that was a good idea. And it was, because that's where I started getting into game design, specifically characters. Okay. So I do, I would, I'm what you call a generalist. I draw a lot. Drawing is the foundation of all art. If you are not drawing today, it is time to start. I have also worked on game simulations. I've just done concept art for a simulation to teach third graders buoyancy, funded by the National Science Foundation. It uses haptic controllers. It's called the Aspect Project. And I also teach. After graduating, I nestled right back into academia. I teach basic drawing at NC State, but most importantly, the main reason why you are all here today, and I see a couple of familiar faces in the audience, is that I teach art for games at Wake Tech Community College, which is awesome. So can I get a holler for all my art for games students out there? Yeah. That's what I like to hear. So today, we're going to talk about one of my truest loves, and that's character design. Making your characters memorable and iconic. Because we know when we start a game, the first thing that helps us enter that, well, is a title screen, but then your character, right? That's what makes you attach to the game. Do you really remember every enemy you killed in Tomb Raider 1? Or do you remember diving Laura Croft off the cliff for the very first time? That's the first entry point to our experience in video games. And we talk about it a lot. Mario is more recognizable than Mickey Mouse. That's kind of incredible. We tell me, everyone, name these three characters. We remember them, they're part of the experience. And sometimes a franchise can be carried by a character alone. This is what the 3D Sonics have taught us. <laughs> but one of the things we talk about when it comes to character design is silhouettes. How many of you have taken a game art class and have had to make like 20,000 silhouettes? All my students should raise their hand. Yes, yes. And you know, you're trying to make each one different so you can have that immediately recognizable character. You know Mario because of his fluffy overalls and his little glo bubbly gloves, right? You know what Link looks like because he wears the same thing every day. You know what Pikachu looks like because he has those bunny ears, y'all. It is iconic. But here's the problem, guys. There are so many game characters. There are over 800 Pokemon now. 800! I just want you to, we started out with 150, and that was a lot. We had a game for the silhouettes. Try, proving that Pokemon's original 150 designs were pretty clever, right? Because when you see Pikachu, you guess who's that Pokemon? And it's Pikachu. Who's that Pokemon? Jigglypuff. But then when you have 800, suddenly that becomes a little bit more problematic. League of Legends has 134 playable characters. And part of the game mechanics is that you understand what each one of them does. And sometimes that doesn't always work. How many League players do I have in the audience? Does anybody know what Talia does? I've never seen her in a game. It's a problem. But some characters stick out, right? Some times we remember them. But we also have a d another issue when we're designing our character silhouettes. And that is we're getting closer and closer to pho photorealism. Don't get me wrong, we are still in some uncanny valley right now. But we're getting very close. And as we get closer to realism, it's we're getting a little harder to make humans a little bit different. I mean, 
How many versions of Girl with Ponytail can we do? So, what I'm offering, oh, what I'm offering to you guys today is that we're going to talk about some extra tools to help your characters be memorable and maybe even one day be as iconic as Mario or Samus or Yoshi. Through color, fashion design, yes, I said fashion design. And I also needed a third thing, so I put design on there. But we're specifically going to talk about the character design as it interacts with the world that the character lives in and changes throughout both the player's experience and what it means to the community as a whole. So it's design and context. Silhouettes are still the number one way to make your characters recognizable, guys. So I'm not saying you shouldn't draw 200 silhouette drawings for every character you should, because you should do that. And you're going to do that with your lives. But this will give you a little extra spice to add to the meal. So let's talk about color. Color is one of the most misunderstood visual components. One of the things that happens is people confuse color with value, and they also want to make it exactly like what they see. You know, they, green grass isn't always green. There's so many different kinds of green. The sky isn't always blue, especially if there's light pollution. Sometimes it's orange. That should not happen. But we can use color to help make our characters pop against these worlds, right? So how many of you have seen the artist Color Wheel before? Oh, thank goodness, I don't have to talk about that. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. How many colors are there in the universe? Really think about it. How many colors are there in the universe? One person said three. Who said 12? Woo! Yes! There are 12 colors in the universe. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Now, if you are a lighting person or maybe more of a science physics person, then you're going to say there's eight. Roy G. Biv. But we're just going to talk about the artist colors today, the artist color wheel, which is how we perceive color. Because we're artists, we're magicians, we're trying to alter people's perceptions. That's really what we're trying to control here. So there's 12 colors, and everything else is a tint, tone, and shade of that color. Now, just in case, I know, it, since all of you know your color wheel, you know your color schemes too, but I'm going to go over it just so we're all on the same level. We got our triadic color scheme. Who's triadic, guys? Mario! That's right. How many other characters use this color scheme? Name a couple. Sailor Moon. Oh, good one! Good one. Sailor Moon, Captain Falcon, Sora from Kingdom Hearts, Superman. This is very common, and we're going to talk about why that color scheme is so common among specifically heroic game characters. We got our complementary, that means they're opposites on the color wheel, right? That's what Wario has. We have analogous, where they're next to each other. Everything goes together. That's what Bulbasaur is straying today. We got the four-way split. That's where things start to get weird. We get a little <laughs> bit into rainbow territory. But it makes them pop, right? Because you know something's going on with baby Bowser, right? He has green, he has yellow, he just doesn't know what to do with himself. That's what he's really upset about. Split complement is where you pick a color next to the color's complement. So here we got yellow orange on tracer instead of straight up orange. And then it fades into a red orange instead of straight up orange. And then you got monochromatic. Mono means one, guys. Morgan is purple. She is purple. So one of the reasons that the triadic color scheme is so prevalent in game characters actually starts with comic books and due to the limitations of print. I don't know how many of y'all who've read Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. You should read that. It will. It's one of the best primers for character, narrative, every kind of design you can think of. And one of the things he talks about is CMYK. Their ability to print could only go so far. So one of the things, the reasons they chose these primary color systems is because they stand out. 
The triadic color system is very pure hue. It pops. They bring each other's differences out so we recognize it. And then you turn the page. You read a Superman or a Batman or a Hulk comic, and you turn the page, and there's that character with that color scheme again and again and again. When we get that repetition of a consistent color scheme that's easily recognizable, that's key, that's easily recognizable, we're nailing into the player, hi, this is my character, these are its colors, you need to recognize it, it is you. Remember it all your time, and please buy my game when sequel 100 comes out. Mario is still happening, you guys, and it's been around for a long time. Superman is still happening. Superman. And oh, wait, he's just an alien from another planet who can lift cars. Kind of amazing. Another thing you need to think about when you're talking about color, though, isn't just color theory. And that's what that color wheel stuff is. That's what all of these color schemes. It's a way to say, hey, these are what's go together even if you don't have good color sense. You actually have a physical tool that you can go back to over and over again, and it will never fail you. But what I think we need to remember a little bit more in our game industry here is that colors have meanings. They have immediate associations. They're, according to the Color Institute of Color Research, when we're looking at media, it's, it's a knee-jerk reaction of how we feel. I think that I'm trying to remember the quote because I don't have it up here, but I think it's 30 seconds or less. That's how fast we're making decisions. Think about when you're going to the store to pick out your wardrobe. What's the first thing you gravitate towards? Color. Color. And those different colors mean different things, and we have certain associations with that color. We have both positive associations, and we have negative associations, right? So blue can be tranquil. It can make you secure. It makes you look like you're honest. So if any of you have to go to court, make sure you wear blue. Okay, that's going to give you one of the best outcomes. Green means, it can mean earth, it can mean tranquility, it can mean money, it can also mean envy. Red can mean passion, but it can also mean anger. Pink can be feminine, but then pink can also be feminine. So you have to research all of these colors in your color scheme, and different tint tones and shades have different associations as well. A lilac purple is going to appear to be much happier than some kind of deep maroon, right? And what you put it next to changes it. When you put pink next to blue, oh, it's pastel. Oh, we're going to a baby shower. You put pink next to orange, it's a fiery sunset. How you pair colors matters. And people associate certain words with color. So over here, this is from the Guide to Color Marketing. You can see that they gave these people buzzwords. And these were the colors that they came up with. So blue, white, and green is trust. Red is speed. Red, fast cars, right guys? High tech is black, blue, and silver. Research your colors. What dominant color is your character? And does the color meaning reflect the character's personality? There's something that I see people do in games, and it's one of my biggest pet pe color pet peeves. I've hated purple for years because people use it in replacement to replace black. Purple is not black, you guys. It's not. It means royalty. Back in England, only royalty could wear purple. It's very important. It's a sign of nobility. It gives you mystery. Purple is not black. Why would do people use purple instead of using black in a character design? Why do you think they do that? Go for it. To make it more flashy. To make it more flashy, because it's a pop color. But you can easily find another pop color that actually reflects the character's personality and not default to purple, because one is the darkest color on the color wheel. And two, because we've used it so repeatedly that it has become a trope. 
I mean, maybe Morgana could wear purple. She once was nobility, her and her sister ruled together. But they used it because Morgana was based off of the Night Elf and World of Warcraft. So, let's stop break using the same old color schemes. You need to develop your own color story. You need to develop your own purple. That's what painters do. Painters never use color right out of the tubes. If you do, you're just gonna, you're like rejected from the fine art society if there is one. Use your own colors. Mix your own colors. Research your own colors. I can't say this enough, you guys. That's why I've like taken up three slides just for this. Colors should reflect the number one personality trait in your character. So, if you look over at this lovely little graphic I have from the Guide to Color Marketing, it shows you a variety of different logos and what that company is trying to make you feel, right? Green is peaceful. Blue is trust. Again, wear blue to your court date. Purple is creative, imaginative, wise. Red is bold. We have a saying in fine art. If all else fails, make it big and make it red. Then you have a good art piece. Orange is friendly. Ironically, when people were getting interviewed for the color marketing guide about what the public likes in their colors, nobody likes orange and yellow. Isn't that crazy? I, I mean, it's fabulous, but I guess they just don't want orange and yellow starburst. So, I also want you to note that BP has a nice little green flower logo now. This logo appeared after the oil spill. <laughs> So I just think that's important to know. So we're going to talk a lot about Leona today from League of Legends, but one of the things that I want you to notice is that she has a complementary color scheme, right? And she's wearing purple. She's a priestess of a golden temple. So it makes sense that she would have this kind of golden color scheme. And she's of the sun. So the yellow makes sense as well, right? She's a hero. Yellow projects optimism. This fits her color scheme very well. And then we have Cassiopeia. Now who knows if they just made Cassiopeia green because snakes are, are supposedly green. They're mostly brown, but for some reason we as a society have decided that snakes are green. And maybe that's all what it started out to be. But the game designers are smart. They tied it into her lore. because She once was the most beautiful, attractive, just good looking. Young lady, and guys, what's Katarina's and Cassiopeia's country called in League of Legends? Anybody? Noxus, in all of Noxus. And basically she got in trouble and got turned into a snake for vanity. So it makes sense that she would re represent this color of envy. Of course, again, it could just be because she's a snake. But I would choose to believe otherwise. So it's not just about what color your character's personality represents. There's practical uses for color as well. Mainly, can you see your character? So how many of you have been playing Horizon Zero Dawn? Woo. Isn't it awesome, you guys? It is the best Heavenly Sword Tomb Raider sequel I've ever played. <laughs> One of the things that I immediately noticed when I was playing the tutorial level is that there is some weird uncanny valley going on with this poor character, Aloy. But I was still attached to her, and I could still pick her up out of everybody, even though she had the same colors as many of the other NPCs, and also she was in a photorealistic world. And what happens in a photorealistic environment, especially something that's desaturated, everything turns gray. So it's very hard to see things. One of the problems I have with this game is they have their interface is white. It's white, you guys, against oh, millions of different tints, tones, and shades of color. It's, all, it's very difficult to see. But Aloy is not. Why, guys? Why my color people? Why is she so easy to pick out no matter what environment she's in? She pops! She pops because she has complementary color scheme. She is blue and orange, one of the most commonly used color schemes. So use it well, carefully, guys. You don't want to look like you're lazy. But here she's used pretty well. Even the browns in her costume have little tinges of orange. Because what they did, they picked a brown, they picked an orange, they mixed them together, 
So that neutral would have a little bit of that orange. It's called a warm orange, brown. You can have a warm black. Warm black is black with a little red in it. Cool black is with a little bit of blue in it. That's why she's, we can always find her no matter where she is because we pick up that blue and orange immediately. We see contrasting things first. We're going to see those contrasting colors first. So we're going to play a little game today. Name that character. We're going to name all of these characters just based on their color swatches. So go ahead, take a guess at the first color swatch. I will say the green is a little off. I did the best I could. Good job, you guys. That's right. It's Samus. Next one. Good job. Next one. Y'all are on point today. Next one. Wario on point. Last one. No, not Horizon Dawn chick, but close. Tracer! Yes! Okay, guys, now it's still gonna get a little harder. What's this one? The first one here on the left. Yes! Lara Croft! Good job! This one. Kratos? Oh, good job, Kratos! Okay, now it's starting to get hard. It's not. I'll give you a hint. Do you need a hint? The most recent iteration of this game has got very poor reviews and has bad facial animations. <laughs> exactly. Commander Shepard. Okay, so this character has different outfits. This is from the latest game that came out. Last one. <laughs> Whoever said um brown, kudos to you. It's Lara Croft. Right? That's how I felt. So Lara Croft has been one of the most iconic female characters in history. Now maybe she hasn't always been in a place that we want her to be, but she's done a lot for women in gaming. We love her for that. And you've got to love that seafoam bodysuit. And bodysuits are in style right now, right when she starts wearing a gray thermal tank top. <laughs> Realism doesn't mean lack of saturation. Realism doesn't mean strong color schemes. Realism doesn't mean gray and brown. Realism means it mimics the natural world, and our natural world is filled with color. So fill your characters with color as well. That being said, choose your color schemes wisely again, because not everybody can see all ranges of color, especially red and greens. But guys, you should stay red away from red and green anyway, because that's Christmas. Think about your color associations. But also be aware of not the actual color, but value. Don't confuse color for light and dark. Light pink is pink. Dark red, maroon, is different. It's darker. It's different in value. So make sure you look at everything in black and white before you say, hey, my character is done. If you're doing it properly, you're creating your character in a full black and white grayscale first and then applying color in Photoshop. But, you know, sometimes not all of us do that. So here are co I'm a couple of color tools for you to use. If you go onto Adobe Color, there you have a nice little color wheel where you select whether you want a complementary color scheme, an analogous color scheme, etc. And it will automatically generate interesting swatches for you. This is a great way not to use default Photoshop green for your grass because that looks electric and grass isn't electric, everybody. <laughs> Don't do that. Also, I'm going to talk a lot about Pantone today. Does anybody know what Pantone is? Tell me about it.
guys, pan, you can order all these different pan pen swatches. And graphic designers are usually the ones that have to order that because you have to figure out what Pantone color you're going to pick for your logo or what your company is. Like, for example, there's a Pantone color that is Minion Yellow from Despicable Me. So everything has a specific color that is branded, and Pantone is like a language. So when the artist says, I use Pantone number one, two, three, four, five, they can go over to an engineer or a producer or a customer or a t-shirt maker or some other kind of company and give them that exact Pantone number and they'll know what it is. Fun fact, Pantone started out as a way to distinguish birds from one another. So you could say that blue jay is this color blue, so it really is a blue jay. Yes. It's very similar to that. And I think, I'm probably wrong, so I shouldn't say this, but I know, it, I'm pretty sure in some coding things, we'll just use generic terms here, you can insert Pantone colors as well. But it swatches, it swatches. And all of you who have Photoshop should be able to load Pantone swatches. If not, go to their website and they can direct you how to get those. I know my Photoshop, for, and I've been using Photoshop since CS2, has always had the Pantone swatches, and I never downloaded them. They've just been haunting me. So let's get to my favorite part about this presentation. So we've talked a lot about color, and a lot of it are things that you already knew. Let's talk about something that maybe you haven't considered as part of your video game lifestyle. So, how many of you play Final Fantasy XIII, or played it? It's, well, I say played it, but it is the game that plays itself, right? Yes. So, its main character, Lightning, aka Female Cloud, was hired to be a model, hired to be a model for Louis Vuitton's Spring and Summer 2016 collection. So, she actually did an interview with tele the Telegraph magazine, and it was completely straight. It was like they were interviewing an actual person. What you also need to know, we're going to talk about colors of the year, Pantone colors of the year in a little bit, is that when in 2016, well, this would actually be 2015 because in fashion they do it the year before, but the Pantone color of the year for 2016 is rose quartz, the same color as Lightning's hair. So that's one of the reasons that she was such a good choice for the collection. And also fashion designers more and more are incorporating video game characters in, as inspiration or even into their designs. So why aren't we? Fashion is a like, multi-billion dollar industry, you guys. And they, when we have these realistic characters, let's go back a couple of slides. Look at, look at our girls with ponytails. What makes their silhouettes different? Their clothes. Clothing design is an essential part of character design, especially the closer we get to realistic characters. Da -da 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 -da. So, how many of you have played Gravity Rush? Yes! So there was a little fan of Gravity Rush who was complaining about the main character's costume. And it's like, well, how does he put, she put that on? There's no way she can get that outfit on. So the game's lead character designer, and I am not going to try to say his name, Really, it, you can read it, it's right there. He released an illustration showing how this character dresses every day. Because that's part of her personality, right? Our morning routines are part of who we are. How she dresses is part of who she is as well. And it dress it, it's one of the primary elements of her design. Let's talk about cosplaying, you guys. How many of you have cosplayed for game characters before? It's a major way for everyone to interact with the game and create a community as a whole. People <laughs> spend tons of money on cosplays. If we go into fashion design and study that a little bit, let's say we also release our own fabrics that is like kale gold satin or vein purple silk spandex. She would wear spandex. That is an excellent way for the game com companies to maybe make a little cash because artists, yes, we must create, but we also got to eat. So we need to think about it in a marketing aspect as well. So 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about fashion, where to go where you can study fashion yourself, and how it actually works. So we're going to, are y'all ready to go into a world that's different from games? Is everybody emotionally prepared? Yes. All right, let's do this. So there's two main types of fashion. There's multiple iterations of this too. Obviously, there's lingerie, obviously, there's sportswear, but a lot of things fall under hot couture and ready to wear. Ready to wear means you can wear it right now. It's ready to wear. Couture is all about hand techniques, and that's where it starts to get more imaginative. It's done by several different houses like Da Vinci, Gucci, Chanel, etc. But the designers of Christian Dior, Givenchy, etc., are always different, even though that it has that name. So Alexander McQueen, he's no longer alive. So it's, oh gosh, I'm going to forget her last name. Her first name's Sarah. They have a new designer for that fashion house now. And it's not just one person. It's like the game industry where they have tons of different people with different skill sets working in the house. And like we have our E3, they have their fashion week. And there's four different fashion weeks that everybody talks about. I mean, Tokyo has their own fashion week, Berlin has their own fashion week, but these are the ones that are most highly publicized and what companies look to when they're trying to figure out trending to the next year. That's going to be in Paris, Milan, London, and New York. New York is famous and America is famous in general for American sportswear. If you want to know what sportswear is, think of Michael Kors, think of Jackie O, think of I look good in my sunglasses with a coat. That's what sportswear looks like. So, most of the trends of the season and these fashion trends also influence interior trends. They've They've affected in your lives in ways you never knew before. They also look at fashion blogs. Now, how you don't hear blogs being talked about seriously that often, but in fashion, it's considered a major source of this is what's going to sell this year. And there's some that they are on the forefront of saying this is what you should buy, this is what you should pay attention to. They're the art critics. The man repeller. And she posts clothes that do exactly what it sounds like. Um, the Blonde Salad, I'm not going to try to say her name. You can read it. She was on Project Runway as a judge, so you know she's legit. These are great fashion blogs for you to look at. And I actually, if anybody cares enough, I have work cited and links if anybody wants to go through that. But just write it down, you guys. You also got to look at fashion icons. And in video games, we have a couple of characters that are close to fashion icons, right? Lightning could be a fashion icon. Laura Croft could be a fashion icon. Cloud could be a fashion icon. Notice I'm not naming a lot of Japanese characters. That's because any of you know who knows anything about Japanese culture, fashion is huge, and that influences games in an outstanding way. Look at these people. If you don't care, which I'm not supporting that any of you care about them, but to understand where to look and pick up different ideas, to find your inspiration and artists, these are good places to start. So I want to talk about Samus a little bit. What makes Samus so amazing? What makes Samus so memorable and great? I'm asking, you can tell me. Oh. Yes! Exactly the answer I was looking for. We had a female character throughout the entire experience. You had no idea that she was a female character. This is emphasized in her armor, which is also upgradable, by the way, so you can't say clothes don't matter in a video game. These shoulders are broad, huge, masculine shoulders. The contrast that this is a feminine or female character to the extreme. They're basically big, giant balls on her shoulder. Well, here's the thing. Metroid came out in 1986. Do we have anybody here who was alive in 1986? Yeah! I wasn't. I was born in 87. <laughs> but there's something else that was going on. So 
in the 80s, we had these lovely puff sleeves that you could just see everywhere that are no longer that common. <laughs> <laughs> and you may notice that Samus is strutting these same oversized ball-like shoulders. The difference is that because we're artists and we're developing a character for a different world, other than our own, that's that fashion trend that quickly left us, thank goodness, became a point of departure to help create one of the most dynamic character silhouettes in existence. So even if a trend seems frivolous to you, it's tapping into something, and it can be an excellent, excellent launching point for someone who maybe never thinks about clothes at all. So I've talked about Pantone already, but let's talk about the Pantone color of the year. Every year, Pantone releases a color, and this color is supposed to reflect certain issues of that year. So this, okay, so apparently particular is really upset that I have it. Okay. So this year is greenery. I wore green earrings just for you guys. And greenery, the re one of the reasons they picked it is because they were worried about the environment. So this was to help them raise environmental issues. Last year it was rose quartz. Uh, the year before that, I'm not sure, but the year before that it was radiant orchid. It changes every year. That's one way they pick the color, is current issues. But here's the other way. They look at fashion first. The Pantone color of the year, every company looks at that, that is making that is dealing with color, whether it's makeup, whether it's interiors, this is an important thing to know. But the thing is, they don't release the color of the year until the actual year. And as a company, and as artists, you want to be trendsetters, not trend followers. So, if you're looking at fashion, who releases all of their shows a year early, so a spring 2016 show is actually taking place in spring 2015 then you are actually putting yourself to be able to be ahead of the game and also tap into a collective consciousness because fashion is what guides our visual world. They're the first. They're, that is who Pantone picks their color of the year. They look at all the different designers, see what colors are happening and repeating. They pick it, boom, this goes with social issues, boom, we like this color, we have this color, boom, color of the year, everyone. Use it. One of the things they also do is they actually release a bunch of swatches that go with their color of the year so you're not just stuck using green for the rest of the year. You can actually find some things that go really well with it. So, and different colors have different feelings, right? Different levels of saturation, different values. You've got the Grand Canyon, you've got the Forest Floor. These are all on Pantone's website. You should look at them, you should study on them, you should like just mark them with a big. So, I made this graphic for you guys, and what I wanted to prove is that if you take a video game, and a fairly realistic video game, and blur it down, it will just become a stagnant gray, and that incorporating the Pantone color of the year will help make characters pop against the background in a more interesting video game overall. When I did this, this was not the conclusion that I came to. I took a screenshot from The Last of Us, Horizon Zero Dawn, Mass Effect Andromeda, and Resident Evil 7. Then I found the, the year that production began, and I got that Pantone color of the year. The Pantone color of the year for when production began is the one below the top color, which is the color of the year that happened when it was released. And when I blurred the colors, I suddenly realized that that's exactly what these games were doing. They were finding these color of the years, and they actually influ had both colors from when they were released and when they started production. So if you look at The Last of Us, the bottom, the whole right part of the picture is yellow. This Pantone yellow right here. I believe it's called Marsala. No, Mimosa. It looks like a Mimosa. So. The other half is the Pantone color of the year of 2013, which is emerald. And it makes sense that bushes would be green. And hey, this guy's yellow, so he'll be light against the green. And light often has a yellow tint to it. 
But the fact that it's almost that exact saturation level is a little bit crazy. The same thing Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, if this doesn't have a lot of greenery in this particular shot, but the overall feel of the color is honeysuckle, the 2011 color of the year. Even poor Mass Effect Andromeda has a little bit of its tangerine color of the year when it started production in there. But I can honestly say that Resident Evil 7 does not have radiant orchid. <laughs> so, the fashion industry is already borrowing from video games. Again, I propose the question, why should we? Uh, this collection for Jill Sanders, the Fall 2010 collection, the designer for that brand, Ralph Simmons, cited Laura Croft as the muse for that collection. So some screenshots from the collection are on the left here, and here's uh, the Tomb Raider anniversary model. You can see resemblance. Not in color, but definitely in silhouette. So, virtual manga characters, they didn't like list which ones, inspired the look of Prada's Fall 2012 collection. And the fashion brand, I'm going to butcher this, but I'm just going to try, you guys. Please forgive me. Mos Gino. <laughs> Released a ready-to-wear brand that features Super Mario characters. And it even has Super in their brand. What's so interesting about this is this brand is known for taking pop culture icons and turning them into textiles. Even the Metal Gear Solid cast is looking fabulous because they had a French designer, Jean-Francois Ray, design glasses. I don't know why it says glasses. I apologize for these characters, including Kojima. He needed something good out of that situation. And one of the things that we can do that fashion designers can't is we actually get to program fabrics. Right now in the fashion industry, that's what people are talking about. They're creating th fabrics called engineered knits. They're, last year, the Met Gala's theme was fashion in the age of technology. And there were all these dresses that incorporated technology into their fabric. The one that you see here is Zach Posen's dress. And you can see it looks like a typical Cinderella ball gown, and then it lights up like magic with little lights. There's also an IV. IBM dress by Marque the brand Marquesa, which you should all look, it's one of my favorite fashion designs, that actually changed colors with your emotions. And the thing is, this is no big deal for us. We, can do, we could do that years ago. We spend entire inches trying to figure out how cloth is supposed to work. We have substance painter that lets us put all sorts of scratches and materials on anything our mind can come up with. We can influence the industry beyond video games. And that's part of what being an icon and being an artist is. It's not just existing in your own universe. It's affecting the universe as a whole. And if we're aware of everything in our path, every different industry that works with the same mediums we do, color, silhouette, good design, gestalt principles, y'all, we can affect the industry as a whole and create more memorable characters because they're going to be looking fabulous. You always remember a fabulous outfit. That's why one of the first things people ask in an interview, who are you wearing? Which isn't always a good thing. That's, I got a little ahead of myself. This slide talks a little bit more about that. But 3D modeling is also very similar to sewing. So my background is in studio art, right? And I started out as a fibers major, even though I actually really wanted to take to design characters. And part through my process, I discovered that I didn't want to make outfits. I just like creating outfits for characters in my head. And that's what guided me to new media and animation. So when I started using 3D modeling softwares like Maya, the 3D Max is shown here, I realized that it was very similar to how I actually construct clothing. I'm dealing with a mesh, like a woven mesh, very similar how fabrics lay. The way that I detach it and reattach it is very similar to seams. And also, you want to get there the simplest way possible. So when we're modeling for video games, we're trying to put the smallest amount of information in there to make it hold its shape. Well, you're going to do the same thing for clothing because you want it to be comfortable, right? So we think we're already thinking in the same way. 
When clothing is something that affects our silhouette so much, we really need to consider how we're using it. Practical clothing isn't always the good thing. We talk a lot about practical armor and why lingerie armor is bad. But then we get characters like Quiet, which could have been the most hilarious joke of the 21st century. But what happened, they released this character and everybody got all upset and they were all hollering on Twitter because that's all what people do on Twitter. And Kojima said, just wait. Just wait till you see why she wears what she wears. And it turns out is this costume design is very practical because she actually breathes Correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but she breathes to her skin. It's very similar to a frog. So it has a practical purpose, but visually, it's not, it doesn't capture our imagination. It makes her iconic in a bad way. If she was going to a red carpet show, she would show up on the worst dress list. And overall, it supports bad ideas in the com community, which is over-sexualized versions of female characters. So, what you should get out of that, practical clothing isn't always right. Let's talk about the Tomb Raider reboot. So we already looked at the colors, right? All of these are possible unlockable outfits in the Tomb Raider, Rise of Tomb Raider game. What do you notice about all of these outfits? They're all covering everything. Say that again? They're all covering everything. That's not what I was going for. <laughs> but that's true. <laughs> what about changes in the silhouette? Let me ask you this. Would you wear any of these looks? I mean, here's the thing. In a, right now, athleisure, which is this kind of athletic wear that you can wear to the grocery store, is one of the hottest industries. Think Lululemon. Think of all the design that goes into Nike or Adidas. It doesn't have to be gray. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be boring to be practical. Laura is from Britain. She's from London, you guys. It's one of the fashion capitals. And she's young. How old is Laura Croft now with the reboot? I think she's fresh out of grad school. So let's put her at like 27, 28. A girl that young from London with her kind of income would be a little bit more plugged into the fashion industry. Why not collaborate with other brands to create a unlockable outfits that are both exciting and believable for her character. Because that's the key. That's why we're going to study fashion, even if you don't care about clothes. Is Does it fit your character? What does it say about them? Just like what do your clothes say about you? So it's about 4.03, so I'm going to whiz through our design on context. And really what I'm talking about here, this is a sum up to why both these color and fashion things are important and how they work with the overall world. So over here we have Aloy and she, you have multiple unlockable outfits in the game, right? Well, one of the things that's so clever about this game and makes her more than just another Ingrid from Game of Thrones is one, she has a consistent color scheme even though the outfits change. You can see, even though there's a new green introduced, the blue and the orange and the brown tones are always going to be there. Also, the color, what the material is made of is actually material that she finds in the world and is, represents the, the game thing as a whole. So she has this armor that's a PCP pipe and metal and all the things from the machines that she's gotten. And the cording isn't traditional leather like you would find in an outfit like this. It's like bungee cord. So it's evident of this very old style, this old clothing, this warrior clothing, combined with technology, just like in the world of Horizon Zero Dawn. We have metal dinosaurs with primitive people. That's kind of incredible. 
Monster Hunter. So we're talking about all this about memorable characters, but the thing is, sometimes you can make that of your own character. There still needs to be a memorable experience for people to want to continue to play your game. And one of the things that Monster Hunter does is not only can you get a ton of different armor sets, but your skills and abilities are actually dependent on those armor sets. They're not like it's not like other RPGs where you can constantly put points into a skill. And these outfits are actually created from monsters that you kill in the game. So the visual experience from your character is directly related to the gameplay. So, we have the Souls series, which if any of you haven't partaken in yet, you should just leave right now and go by. <laughs> because it, there's some very interesting visual storytelling. Now normally I don't condone a gray having too many, a game having too many gray tones, but one of the things that Demon Souls does is it makes you feel a little bit sad because it's so gray, but then they'll give you drops that have a little bit of a spice of color. And some of the most interesting as far as silhouette and color armor sets in the game are from NPCs. But the problem is, in Demon's Souls and Dark Souls, if you kill an NPC, that can affect your game experience as a whole. It can also, it's gone forever. So when I first played Dark Souls, I killed Solar, so I could have his armor. And then people started invading my game, and I didn't know why. It was because he's one of the most beloved characters in the franchise. <laughs> so that character's outfit alone and how you interact with that becomes a memorable experience beyond the game. And that's one of the reasons we remember these characters so well, is because their armor sets them apart in a desolate world, and we can get it, and we might face the consequences to get it. Characters can change visually holistically, and that can contribute to the story. So, when Wander is in the Shadow of Colossus and he's killing all these beautiful Colossus and you kind of feel guilty about it, but yeah, you're the hero, everything's fine, right? <laughs> and then you see that he's starting to look like a kind of a dark character. He gets a little veiny, he suddenly gets horns, and this is foreshadowing to suggest that maybe what you're doing isn't the best action. So, Drinkbox Studios recently released a game called Severed, and this young lady starts out with an arm missing and a gray costume. And you are literally going around fighting monsters, severing body parts and attaching them to yourself. Drastically changing your silhouettes and also upping your powers. What you wear is part of the game experience. But it also continues to work, adding all these Mod Podge pieces together because they have a united color scheme coming from the same inspiration, like those Day of the Dead colors that inspired their other game, Guacamole. Guacamole. Sorry, sometimes I can't say words. Last but not least, let's talk about Fiona so a little bit more. So, I already talked about how she has a complementary color scheme. I already talked about what purple means. It means nobility. And she is a priestess, right? She's a warrior priestess. Well, here's the thing. Leo, Leona was League of Legends' first official tank, guys. I know Bloodscrank apparently is supposed to be female, and you can play Tangana, but I mean, she was designed to be a tank. She's by no means the first tank in video, female tank in video games. But what happens is we have these other female tanks, right? But they look very, very similar to male characters as well. And one of the things that we have learned as we've grown as a society is not about having similar rights and roles and them being exactly the same. It's also about celebrating our differences and those differences not inhibiting you, but helping you thrive. And that's one of the reasons Leona's design does, because what they did they took one of the most classic dress silhouettes called Quist and Drawer's New Look. It's the 1950s silhouette. And that silhouette was created as a response to create a more... Women had been working in the factories while men were off to war. And so it was a return to femininity. And they took that silhouette and stripped it down to create this metallic leather armor. We had the materials, programmable fabrics, it's all coming together. The materials that it's created from, 
suggest armor, but also work in that silhouette. I feel like she could block bullets by twir twirling. There's a little bit of, how many of y'all know what Art Nouveau and the arts and craft movement is? There's a little bit of gold gilding too that you can find in, old, in classic art. This is a very smart game design. And this is a way to show that a character like this has helped create a more dynamic cast of game characters throughout the community as a whole. And that simply changing the silhouette, paying attention to your color and what it means, and last but not least, looking at fashion can help you have more dynamic character designs beyond creating fun drawings alone. Have work cited, guys. If anybody wants it, I went through and I like cited all this stuff for two days. So, if you care. Then it is right at 4:10, so we got five minutes of questions, you guys. Go for it. I just wanted to um uh um uh to see what your opinion was on a lot of, like a lot of the Japanese culture and their use of um uh art and style and video games. How it's so um uh out there compared to, um, I guess, nor North American standards. Um, uh, what your opinion on that was and what you think that says about that culture? Well, one of the things that I love about um, Japanese fashion and visual K is that there, um, in Japan, that is a form of rebellion. And I feel like, in, at least when I was growing up, especially in the South, that clothing was more of a form of assimilation. And so that's something that I find really exciting. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why we love JRPGs so much, is because they're not afraid to go out there. They're avant-garde in their everyday. And I hope that someday we can all be avant-garde in our everyday fashions, practices, that it's not just about the practicality, but about the idea. At the same time, if you're looking for inspiration from that, you have to be careful because it's not your culture. So when you are trying to find inspiration for characters and you like that out there fashion, find something out there within your own story. Look in your own experiences when you're taking a character and that kind of prevents bad things happening. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Okay, next one. One thing I've been wondering, um, I know you talk I don't know. I'm going to ask that. I'll figure that out. Any other questions over here? I think that's brilliant. So I look up wedding cakes. I have a wedding cake for my. So I've been working on a comic for a very long time. And I have a wedding cake for every one of those characters. Because it's a different medium, and they have different techniques. And one of the ways that techniques have, are developed is by looking at something else. Okay, I want to do that in this medium. So in, for example, digital painting. Digital painting is heavily based off of a painting medium. But now we've developed new things like adjustment layers that allow you to do things that you can't do in painting, like an undo button. So you can write the Don't You Wish Life kind of undo button. So that's what happens when you look at other, and that's really what I was talking about with my fashion, it's just that fashion more directly relates to your character, is that look at different things. Don't just look at game things. Don't just look at other characters in video games because you're not gonna come up with anything original. You're gonna come up with something that's smart and solid, but you're not gonna do something that puts you in an encyclopedia. That's not necessarily everybody's goal. But I hope at least some of you, y'all's goal. I hope to see some of you in an encyclopedia. Anybody else? Go for it. Um, do you see programs like Marvelous Designer having any impact in fashion? I'm not familiar with Marvelous Designer. Tell me about it. Uh, Marvelous Designer is essentially just uh, it's like a, a, a cloth drapery program where you actually oh, gotcha. do the pattern and have it wrapped. Absolutely. In fact, they're already doing that. And VR is actually being incorporated from the fashion industry. So what they're doing, there's 
it's in my one of my articles for my, this presentation, and I can't remember the brand that was doing was doing it. It might be Chanel. It might be Chanel. But they actually have set up VR stations to show their clothing in digital space, so they can to render clothing in a believable way and. You know, movement has drama, and when you view these fashion shows, they're going to talk about what has movement, what has drama. What a great way to make clothing have movements that actually use cloth simulators. So I absolutely think that will help influence the fashion industry. I, I would like to see the video game industry and the fashion industry nailed a little bit more to where that we get to lead some of the fashion trends and we get to lead a little bit of what's going on worldwide in visual culture like fashion does. And I think we're almost there. Almost there, you guys. Let's see, what time is it? I got time for one more. One more. Anybody? Okay. Um, this is kind of a plug for me. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be doing uh, character art routines. <gasps> What's your name? Uh, Crystal Brown. Where do you work? Uh, I work at FunCom. <gasps> Everybody, go to his character critiques at FunCom. Tell me your name one more time. Crystal Brown. Crystal Brown. Yes. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for everything. You know, I hope you learned something. If you didn't, I hope you at least had a good time. Please enjoy the rest of the conference, and I will see you around.